The Tarrant County Master Gardener Association has partnered with the Tarrant Regional Water District to encourage water conservation. TRWD maintains four area lakes and pipelines needed to provide surface water to local water treatment plants so they can clean that water to meet drinking standards for our communities. They also work with many cities in Tarrant County, such as Fort Worth, Arlington, Mansfield, and many others to provide water conservation programs to the community. Conservation is an important water supply strategy to help meet the needs of our growing population. There are currently 2.3 million people living in Tarrant County and this is expected to double over the next 50 years. At SaveTarrantWater.com, you can sign up for free weekly watering advice custom to your location. If you're a resident of Tarrant County, you can sign up for a free sprinklers checkup where a licensed irrigator comes to your home, provides a comprehensive evaluation of your system with recommendations to reduce water waste. There's also an event calendar where you can find information about future classes and workshops. So be sure and check out SaveTarrantWater.com to sign up for their free services. I'm Harold Annis, Tarrant County Master Gardener. I was uh, in the intern class of 2011. I have a two-acre lot in Southlake that I have a, a fairly sizable garden, about 10,000 square feet that I grow uh, vegetables in. So you name it. If I like it, I grow it. So today we'll talk about several um, key components in gardening. This is the outline for a much longer presentation. And if you want to do that, we'll just stay here for three hours and we'll, we'll cover it in an hour, uh, the highlights of it. So we'll talk about the site. What kind of, uh, where am I going to plant my vegetables? Sun, how much sun do we need? Seed, what kind of seeds will we plant? Where will we get them? and what uh, varieties are the best. The season, when do I plant? And when do I plant what type of vegetable? And soil, soil is obviously a major component in gardening. Here's my garden, I told you it was uh, sizable, but uh, this would be in the springtime, probably April. And the um, stone hinge back there is how I do tomatoes in the spring. Uh, wrap them with frost cloth, and it gives them additional protection from the cold and from the wind. So there's uh, some of the vegetables I picked uh, on a particular day in July. So that was kind of the height of the season. And uh, you notice this box up here is full of tomatoes also. And when that happens, I just have to find a lot of friends. So there's a lot of different ways, you know, you saw the picture of my garden, uh, you can garden in the ground um, if you have a large enough space or want to dedicate as part of your uh, backyard or front yard. I had a neighbor that did his garden in the front yard. He called it a show garden. So he was from West Texas. So here's another idea of raised beds. And this, this is at Grapevine Colleyville uh, ISD's uh, Heritage Elementary School. Heritage is uh, right across the street from Colleyville Heritage High School. So these are raised beds. They're three foot by eight foot or three foot by seven foot, depends on the curvature of the sidewalk there. This one we made uh, with a toe kick to help specifically one child that was in the fourth grade in our garden club that could not stand on her own. She had a, a walker. So we uh, designed this and she could stand up, uh, support herself uh, with her toes and the toe kick and she could plant and harvest vegetables. So that's an idea uh, that you can use uh, if, if you have uh, one of your family members is limited. This is Western Red Cedar, it makes a good good box and uh, last a long time. These are now six years old and still uh, very solid. Here's another example of some enabling beds that we have at our demonstration garden at the resource connection. It's really uh, by Tarrant County South Campus. That's uh, an idea if you have somebody in a wheelchair, this gives you wheelchair access. So don't, don't think you have to garden in the ground. You can do a lot of other things. Okay, you can garden in pots and a lot of people do that. Uh, with tomatoes, uh, my best recommendation is using a large pot, 30 gallons. 
I would say at, at least a 15 gallon, unless you're doing a small patio tomato or something like that. When, when I dump the soil out of this pot, the bottom of it will be totally roots like you'd dump out a uh, potted plant uh, that you grow in your house. So the root structure of a tomato is, is fairly large. So don't, don't scrimp on the pot size if uh, you get the largest that you can. It helps retain the water and you don't have to water it quite as frequently. Another idea, so far as where you're gonna plant, you can use uh, some vertical space. Here's a, a picture of a, a lattice that goes up and you can grow uh, cucumbers, beans, even cantaloupe. And if you're uh, brave enough, you could do watermelons, but just know that the cantaloupe and watermelon, you'll have to support uh, with some device. And I say that's where pantyhose are used today. Uh, you just tie the pantyhose underneath the uh, fruit and uh, support it by the wire on the fence. So that way you can expand your garden. So also you wanna make a plan. Okay, so here's a good plan. And if this is north, then uh, you'd wanna put the tall vegetables on the north side. I think this is tomato plants here. So uh, you don't wanna shade out the low growing fruit or plants. Okay. So here's Neil Sperry's statement, have a plan. So uh, I say that's good for the spring garden. That's a good time to do is uh, December and January. So you can, you can be gardening in the house. For the fall garden right now, you could do that plan or do it in July some of the things you want to plant in August and even July for tomatoes. So don't overcrowd, know how big the plant is gonna be. Sun, so we do need sun. Different plants need different lengths of sunlight per day. And, and there's lots of things that you can adjust to your site or to your situation. So. If if you have, you know, bright sunlight, uh, basically sunlight all day, here's some examples of fruit, vegetables that you can plant if you have bright sunlight. Okay, some gardens are uh, partially shaded and that's probably more the case of a residential place. And uh, yes, you can grow vegetables in, in a partial shade. You may have to be, uh, you know, they've got, I don't uh, think this guy's planting himself trouble with putting trees here uh, between and have the garden between trees and a rock wall. So, but uh, he'll find that out. That's not mine. What's a gardener to grow in these shady spots? Here's some, okay, tolerate partial shade. Okay, so basically, if you say, if I eat the roots or shoots, uh, then, uh, the plant usually uh, requires less light. So beets, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, turnip. You know, most of these are called cold crops and they're very good candidates for, for the fall garden. Maturity rates. You also want to consider the maturity rate. Um, so I've made this statement that, you know, in the spring, we're working between the last frost and the first 100 degree day. And in the fall, we're working from that 100 degree day in the first freeze or frost. So we're, we're, we're always being pushed. So I try to plant in the spring as early as I can. And uh, in the fall, um, as early as the temps will allow for the, um, for the vegetable to sprout and, uh, and to grow. So there's uh, things such as germination uh, temperatures, and we'll talk about those later. So here they are, uh, quick. Uh, and also if you're doing uh, gardening with uh, children or a school garden, these are really good candidates to plant for a school garden. It's the plant, the children can plant them and harvest them in the same semester. 
Here's some with a little bit longer maturity rates. Okra is probably not, and corn's not. And tomatoes are not very good for uh, school gardens because um, you, you, the tomatoes are uh, ripe uh, into June, and then um, uh, you need to plant them in July and August for the, uh, the fall crop. And it's a little challenging to get ripe tomatoes before the frost. But these others, broccoli and onions and cabbage, those will uh, withstand a frost and in some cases a freeze. I know broccoli will uh, withstand down to about 25 degrees. So I have picked fall broccoli in March. Uh, that's a great crop for school gardens. So the kids can plant them in September and pick them several times because with broccoli, you pick the head and it shoots after that, it shoots up smaller heads and you pick those and it sh shoots up smaller than that heads. And, and you can go about four or five uh, iterations on that. So they always have fun. And, uh, and if you're organic, uh, they can also eat it in the garden. Okay, a little longer maturity rates. I want to say cauliflower, I only grow in the fall. Uh, if I plant it in September, then uh, that would be harvested from late December to sometime in February. It depends on the weather and all that. With cauliflower, you pick the head and that's it. You get one, one crop. And sweet potatoes, you plant those in May and dig them in September. So that's not a good one for school gardens. So there you go. Um, some... Uh, crops that take a little longer maturity. And most of those you'll see in the, in the, uh, in the spring. If you want to plant pumpkins for the uh, October, uh, then um, plant them in July. You may have to shade them a little bit uh, as the plants uh, if they're out in the full sun. Okay, plan your most successful garden ever by using crops that naturally thrive where you live. What vegetables do we grow? Okay, the questions, my answer is always, what do you, do, what do you use? Or what do you eat? Or what does your wife eat? Or your husband? Or your mother-in-law? So somebody in the family likes it before you. Don't plan it if uh, nobody likes it. Uh, succession and rotation plan. So you want to rotate your crops. You've heard that of farmers uh, rotating their crops. So you do the same thing with your backyard garden. Uh, if you're gardening in pots, then every two or three years, you can just change out the soil in the pot, dump it out in your flower bed and start over with a new mix. You're, you're dumping out the, um, the residual uh, disease from that tomato plant or whatever it is that you're planting in there. If you have enough pots and rotating different crops in there, then you could use it longer than two or three years. Okay, the size, will it fit? So as I said before, you don't put that uh, big tomato, a uh, large tomato with non-determinate that grows to eight foot tall in a five gallon pot. It just will not perform. So don't do that. And what's adapted to our climate? So, and we'll uh, talk more about that in just a minute here. It says, uh, use recommended varieties for North Central Texas, okay. So we're going to go to the Aggie Horticulture website and do a little tour there. So write this down, aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu. So here's the Aggie Horticulture website. And note that it's aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu. This is my first go-to reference. If I have a question or get a question from somebody, I'm gonna to go to this website for vegetables, vegetable resources. So it, it's pretty uh, easy to, to navigate through it. So I clicked on vegetable resources. 
And now there's a couple of um, icons that I like to use. Easy Gardening Fact Sheets is a, a great resource and I'm gonna click on that. And here there's a host of different vegetables that, that you might wanna plant. So if I click on uh, beans and note uh, that everything is not exactly like you think it ought to be because here's beans down here, green beans, okay? So just uh, if you don't see it first, what you want to, uh, to research, look down through the whole list and see if there's something else that it, so I clicked on green beans and here's a, um, a sheet that tells me about green beans. It tells me the varieties and, and uh, you could consider this in Texas, okay? So it's not limited to North Central Texas and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, explore that in a minute. Uh, so there's different kinds of green snap beans, lima beans, uh, soil preparation. So it's going to tell you what kind of soil the beans like, how to plant the beans, what kind of fertilizer, or how much fertilizer, how to water, the row spacing, and care during the season, insects, what, what bugs are going to bug me, and it, and uh, sometimes it'll give you pictures of uh, insects or disease uh, that may affect your plants. So it even tells you how to serve green beans. Well, a lot of you have your own ideas, so go for that. So there's a, um, in the Easy Gardening series, I'm gonna go back to the list and note that there's other things here like fertilizing, um, there's soil solarization that's with the clear plastic that's uh, anchored to the ground, uh, covered up edges so that it doesn't vent, uh, can get up to 170 degrees. So it's going to kill bugs, uh, nematodes, and uh, it'll also kill a lot of weed seeds. So that's a great way and uh, you don't have to add any chemicals to your ground. So there's uh, a couple of nice places to re research for your garden. Okay, the other is vegetable variety recommendations that I use. And this first click, I come up with a, a map of Texas and uh, we happen to be in region B, which is called North Central Texas in this. Uh, and I clicked on that and uh, I've selected all vegetable varieties and uh, I can do a particular vegetable, but I always just like to use all vegetable varieties. And I'll enter. And this comes up with a list. And note this list is recommended varieties for North Central Texas, okay? So if, if you haven't gardened here before and you don't have experience, stay with beans. Here's some varieties that you will have a better chance of having luck. So for example, top crop and tender crop, uh, they're a great green bean without the strings. So they're, uh, and they, uh, this top crop, the last in the bean uh, list says 50. That's uh, 50 days uh, to harvest, okay, from planting. So there you go. Um, if you want it uh, quickly. And uh, again, that would be a good candidate for a school garden because they could plant in uh, September and harvest them in uh, November. Just know you'd have to have a fairly large space to have enough to, to do anything with. The lima beans take a little longer. So there you go. There's about any kind of uh, vegetable. Asparagus only do in uh, February. You buy the root stock and you, there's a uh, fairly complex system to plant them. Uh, you'll find that on the Easy Gardening series. So if you want to do asparagus, uh, you, it's a little work at first, but um, my asparagus has been there for 25 years. Plant one time, harvest for 25 years. So there you go. 
okra you can plant in the spring or the fall or usually the spring planting carries over into the fall until freeze. There's broccoli. So if you plant broccoli, I always recommend the large head variety. Uh, I don't care for the broccolini because it, it has much less production. And uh, with the uh, larger heads, the Pac-Man and Green Comet. Um, so if you're buying that at the store, uh, I would say read the package, uh, make sure that you're buying a, uh, a broccoli that has the large head. If you like the other kind uh, for stir fry or whatever, then that's fine, go for it. Or just take your ranch dressing out to the garden and have a, have a little snack right there. So notice that in tomatoes, there's, they break it up into different uh, sizes, okay? Uh, and, and the D's and the I's here, uh, I'm looking at early girl, uh, it says uh, D, it's for determinate. So a determinate tomato grows to a height and uh, produces its fruit and then it's done. So I think of, um, uh, you know, farm production. Uh, so, so you want all the fruit to be ripe at the same time so you can have an efficient harvest. Indeterminate, which is what I like, uh, the fruit is going to spread out over a longer period of time, uh, maybe a month or more. And those plants, uh, you can think uh, tomato vine versus tomato bush. In the uh, summer of 2018, I pulled out a, um, a tomato plant from my greenhouse that I'd planted in August of 17. It was a um, Juliet small variety, grape tomato. And the tomato was, uh, plant was 15 feet long. So there you go. Uh, you, can, uh, you can grow some pretty big vines. And it did produce a lot of tomatoes. Okay, when you go to the store to buy seeds, take this list with you, unless you already know what you're gonna plant. And uh, if at all possible, buy uh, varieties that are on this list. Uh, that's uh, another good reason to uh, buy online in, in uh, like a burpee seeds or park seeds or some of the other seed catalogs that you'll be more likely to uh, be able to match up the variety with uh, what you want to plant. So if, like, if you go to Home Depot, the guy in uh, North Carolina didn't choose what you're going to plant in Texas. We'll go back. Just briefly on the uh, the website, uh, Vegetable Problem Solver. There's um, some wonderful pictures here, especially for tomatoes. So if you have problems with your fruit or your vines, here's a picture that you could you could match up with your conditions at home. And uh, you'd click on that and it'll tell you what control measure you need to take to avoid that. So that's probably enough. And that's good for spring or fall, whatever, anytime you're growing those tomatoes or watermelons or whatever. Okay, again, aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu. I don't really go to the commercial production. Most of us uh, will not need that. So we, we toured the uh, Aggie Horticulture website, and now um, seeds or plants. I frequently get the question, what vegetables do you use seedlings and which vegetables do you use uh, seeds in your garden? Um, this is kind of a, a busy sheet, but I'm gonna use it just as a reference. So as I go down this, and we'll talk more about it in a minute, but, um, you'll see that um, most of these, well, asparagus we talked about, uh, broccoli, I will buy uh, plants or I will start my own plants. Uh, for the spring, I will start them in January. Uh, for the fall, you'd start them probably in July or, or early August, or you'd plant the seed for the seedlings. Or you just wait till September and go to the box store and, and buy some. Depends on how many you're growing, you know. Um, Brussels sprouts, uh, they do well in the fall, uh, not so well in the spring. 
because uh, it gets hot and the, uh, yeah, just like cabbage, it, it wants to, um, well, it gets the little green worms, the cabbage loppers. So, uh, but Brussels sprouts will uh, withstand uh, 25 degrees. Uh, I have picked, uh, uh, I actually have taken out Brussels sprouts in March when I was planting uh, the uh, spring crop. So there's a good, uh, if you like uh, Brussels, then go for them. Uh, cauliflower, I do that in the uh, fall only. And again, plant that in September. In the spring, uh, cauliflower uh, will, um, it just takes longer for it to develop and by the time it is developed, then it's hot and it wants to bolt. So you don't get a nice clean white head. In the fall, you do, because uh, it's cool when it's developing. Uh, and another trick is to just wound the leaf that uh, the leaves that are close to the, uh, the flower and lay them over on top of, uh, don't totally uh, just, wound the spine of the uh, leaf so that it wilts over on top of the, the cauliflower and you'll get whiter, prettier uh, fruit. Okay, so most of these onions I use sets. Um, um, tomatoes, I will use transplants uh, and with tomatoes, uh, I will start, uh, I'll buy them from a seed catalog I like to plant about eight different varieties and I can't always find those in the store. So I, I tend to, uh, to buy the seed and start my own plants. Uh, and I do that about January 1st. Uh, this past year I planted, uh, I set the tomatoes out on February 28th. So that's a little earlier. That's the earliest I've ever done, but the weather forecast looked okay. And I put the frost cloth around it. So give it some protection. In the, in the, so in the fall, you can take that frost cloth and uh, in November, wrap your tomato plant. Uh, yeah, don't wait until uh, they say tonight, it's gonna be 30 degrees. Go out there on a nice day and wrap it up. Uh, so you get that extra protection. If if you're in the ground with your tomatoes, if you're in a pot, you can wrap it, uh, but you can also just get a dolly and roll the pot into the garage or, or some protected space. Uh, and after that uh, two day, 25 degree day uh, temperature spout is over, we usually get two or three more weeks of nice weather in the fall. So invariably it gives you just one cold spot. And if you can take the, uh, take the tomato in, uh, then you're not forced into fried green, green tomatoes, okay? So that's just some hints uh, that I have for you. So choose the best plants, recommended varieties, okay? Fruit trees, vegetables, buy the healthiest specimens of the most recommended types. Okay, do your homework ahead of time. So uh, in the, uh, for the spring garden, you'd do that planting in uh, December, January. Uh, for the fall garden, do it in uh, uh, July. Also, you would be uh, preparing your beds uh, in, uh, for the fall garden in July and August. Season, when do I plant each vegetable type? Okay, and here we'll go back to that same uh, handout. This happens to be from Marshall Grain. I'm not trying to plug them, but it, it, it was handy. Uh, so here, this has uh, for all the different uh, vegetables that's over on the, the left column, uh, kind of in the middle, it has spring planting dates. And then uh, right next to that to the right is the fall planting dates. Okay, so this is a good guideline. Um, uh, I don't use this as a Bible, uh, so to speak, uh, because I know uh, the one uh, thing that I really have issue was uh, tomatoes in the uh, spring. 
uh, it gives you till May 12th. And I'm here to tell you that if you wait till May 12th to set your tomatoes out, you won't get any tomatoes. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a minute here. So it's good to have a chart like this uh, so you know when to plant. Um, I see it's more important in the springtime to plant as soon as you can. In the fall, uh, you know, again, we're, we're wrestling between the 100 degree heat and the first frost. So here's the chart that you don't see very often, uh, and it's maybe a little complicated, but if I take the first uh, beet uh, and the green dot is the um, a practical temp. So if I put beet seeds out at uh, 45 degrees um, soil temp, uh, then they will probably um, germinate and sprout. The ideal temperature is the black dot. Uh, so the beet seed really likes 85 degrees. So that's probably why beets would be a better fall crop because you're going to plant them when it's hot. They're going to sprout and then uh, they're going to get ripe and mature when it's cool. So you're going to have a better quality crop. Um, there's carrots, the same thing. Uh, carrots will carry throughout the winter. Um, I've had that at the school garden, kids pull the carrots in uh, February and March that they planted in September. So here's corn. If you want to plant corn, that's a great crop for the fall. And you notice that uh, the practical temp is 55 degrees. So when I plant corn in the spring, it's uh, in, I'm saying the soil temp is 55 degrees. So if you take a meat thermometer uh, from your husband's uh, barbecue grill or whatever, if you want to spare your life, um, just stick it down in the, in the soil uh, about the depth that you're going to plant the seed and uh, see what it says. If it says 55, that's the soil temp that you'd use. But look at corn, it really likes 95 degrees. So if you go out there and plant corn in August, it's gonna jump up. Um, I, I make the rows, uh, put water in the row, and then uh, plant, put, uh, lay the seeds in the row, and then cover up with dry soil. And uh, doing that method, I've had corn come up in three days. In the spring, uh, corn comes up in two weeks or more. So that's the difference uh, this makes uh, is the soil temp. And this is really a good chart to have um, in your reference book, uh, in your seed uh, box. So there's tomatoes, uh, they like it, um, they like it hot. Uh, so 85 degrees, so that's why uh, it's best to start them in the greenhouse. And, and know also that the tomato uh, blossoms that you get in the spring uh, will, um, if you plant them late in the season, like in May, at 90 degrees, thereabouts, plus or minus, depend on variety, but about 90 degrees, the blossoms will not set fruit. So it's just too hot uh, for them to do that. Uh, so you can plant them in May. I, one year I planted at Mayfest because I had some tomatoes damaged by the, the hail. And those that I replanted in May had no fruit whatsoever. So if, you, if you're wondering why your tomatoes in the, in the uh, summer didn't have any uh, fruit, that could be a reason. There's lots of other reasons, but... Okay, enough on that. Soil, do not compromise, okay? So... So don't scrimp on the bed preparation, okay? The smaller the plant type, it's annual or perennial. For example, if I'm planting uh, lettuce, uh, I make that seed bed really smooth. Uh, in fact, with lettuce, uh, with the, uh, the fourth graders, I will have them 
just smooth out the uh, the planting bed uh, and spread the seeds on top of that and then cover the uh, seeds with uh, compost that's uh, that's been sifted so it's very fine so then we don't have the problem of too deep some of these little small seeds uh, if you plant them too deep they'll never reach the surface and you'll never have a salad for your lettuce okay essential elements what how am i going to fertilize so here's some uh, essential elements and notice in the red that nitrogen phosphorus and potassium so on when you buy a bag of fertilizer it has npk k is the uh if you look at the um uh this element chart uh k is the symbol for potassium okay so every bag of fertilizer if it uh, advertised that it's a uh, fertilizer then it has to have uh, the percent nitrogen, the percent phosphorus, and potassium. Okay, and so there's other minor elements, uh, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur you see in the, in the yellow color, and then lots of trace elements. I will point out that tomatoes like calcium and they like zinc. So if you, um, if you want to add uh, a little calcium and zinc to your tomatoes as they're growing, that's a good thing. So how do I know um, how much fertilizer to put on, uh, on my garden? And this applies any time of the year, or how much to, do I need to put on the yard? I know we used to say 15, 5, 10 mixture for, for your yard. Well, we've since uh, discovered that Texas soil has lots of phosphorus. So uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. So now it's more uh, nitrogen only uh, on your yard. But how do I know? Here it is. Soil test. Okay, you want to do a soil test and you can do that uh, whether you're gardening in the yard or in a pot or in a raised bed, whatever you're doing. Write that um, address down. Uh, website http okay soil testing .tamu .edu. you go to that website to get the form and um, and you can use a uh, a paper bag we'll talk talk more in the next slide here okay so there are some general recommendations but let's uh, not dwell on those right now so here's the soil testing form and note that in the upper right hand corner, it says SU20. So that's, uh, that, that is the version for 2020. So whatever year you're in, you wanna make sure that you're using the current version. Um, and um, I think they revise that form every year. Uh, and probably the main thing is um, they revise the pricing. So here's the pricing down here. And um, I think it's like $12 for a basic test, which is the one that um, most of us really need. Uh, they will uh, test the trace element or micro elements back up. They will test the uh, NPK and the uh, trace elements, not the micro. So here's a soil test uh, results. So I did a, um, a test of uh, some soil that I bought from a commercial uh, place uh, and you know you'd think well I it said they said it was good stuff uh, and it was called a uh, dairy mix so gosh it's got dairy stuff in it and it ought to just really grow uh, but you know when they dump it out in your truck or on the ground it's smoking so that tells me that that mix is uh, using up nitrogen so the decomposition process uses lots of nitrogen so right there uh, and this soil test tells me the very first line um, nitrate n is nitrogen and you see the chart it goes about a fourth of the way over 
you see the dotted line in the middle there, that's where you're targeting for. So anyway, that soil was way low on nitrogen. It was over almost toxic on phosphorus. So, and that, uh, that stands the reason because it's a manure product. Uh, and uh, so you're gonna have lots of phosphorus. So if you're using manure products, especially get your soil test and don't use uh, fertilizer with that middle number, um, anything but zero, okay? Down here, it says phosphorus at the very bottom of the page. Phosphorus is highly elevated uh, and it says, uh, avoid uh, phosphorus for the next five years, okay? Uh, and I've tested that soil since then and I got the same uh, alert. So it takes a long time for phosphorus to, uh, to work its way out of the soil to leach through, uh, not so with nitrogen. So there's a good reason you see uh, the potassium is, is uh, elevated. So that's probably why they like to say, if, if you have no other uh, information, then just using a nitrogen-based fertilizer is the best uh, uh, way to go. Okay, so here's good soil. Uh, and it, uh, this happens to be potatoes. And um, this, this mulch is only half done. So it was done for, uh, the picture was done for a demonstration purpose that, uh, so irrigation is important. And I can just put a hose in that uh, trough, if you will, to the right of the each row. And uh, it runs to the other end, the water does. Again, still on soil, here's, uh, a picture in January. Uh, so I'm getting ready to plant tomatoes. And, um, and this on top of the ground is compost. So I've put uh, 10 wheelbarrows full of compost in each row. So that's uh, six cubic foot uh, in each wheelbarrow. So uh, if I didn't fill it completely, let's say 50 cubic feet, that's really two cubic yards of compost in each row. So uh, with a tomato that ro runs down to about two cubic feet per tomato. So you say a bag of compost per plant uh, if you're using the, the large variety plants, uh, the indeterminates, okay? So um, that does uh, really well. And the next year, it provides benefit for the next crop that goes into that space. Because the next year, that tomato crop uh, is gonna be on the other side of the little fence that you see to the left. So every year they get to rotate to a new spot. Rotation is important. And you do it by families, okay? Just since we mentioned rotation, do it by families. Tomatoes, um, peppers, eggplant are all in the same family. So you don't wanna chase one after the other. There's a well-prepared seed bed. Um, and I say this, this is not my picture. Uh, so that's probably an engineer that did that. So if you uh, like that kind of uh, activity, go for it. Okay, in the fall, this is a spring picture, but uh, this is a row cover or frost cloth. So you could put that over your uh, crops in the fall. Uh, if you had a row of beans and you wanted to cover them, uh, you wanted to carry them over into December to avoid that that one freeze that we have in late November, uh, that's a way to do it. You have to support the uh, frost cloth up off the plant foliage because if the foliage is right up against the fabric, then it'll freeze. So that's an idea for protection. And yeah, you could go out there, uh, an individual plant and put a bucket over it or something like that, and that works too. Okay, so here's, uh, again, I've talked about the frost cloth, uh, and that's uh, in the lower right, um, how um, you do a tomato cage. 
if your cages are not that big, that's fine. Just wrap them up. And if you're trying to protect from frost, then you would include the top. You would uh, cover up the top of the cage with the frost cloth. Uh, when I do tomatoes, um, I, I will trim off the lower limbs, the upper uh, left there, so that the rainwater or irrigation water is not throwing soil or splashing soil up to the leaves. That's a good way to get early blight. So you just kind of trim it up. And the best irrigation would be a drip hose down beside that tomato plant. And if it's spraying at all, then turn it where it sprays down to the soil, not up to the plant. You'll avoid a lot of disease. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the presentation. Have fun, keep gardening. Thank you.